Good morning, everybody. The instruction course is uh, setting up an ROP in clinic need of the day. We are fortunate enough to have Dr. Dogra with us, who has pioneered ROP clinic setup in India, in fact. And most of us practicing ROP in different parts of, the, of India are his students. Thank you, sir, for being our mentor and giving us such great training. Uh, I also welcome other uh, speakers. The, no, I, I don't have my first slide. It has to be the instruction course slide. Then all the speakers will come. So I welcome Dr. Ajay Kapoor, Dr. Praveen Sain, yeah, Dr. Diksha and Dr. Anil. Who would be who are masters in their own area, and without any delay, I'll be calling upon Professor Dogra, who can appropriately be called father of ROP in India. Sir, please deliver your talk about journey of ROP. I would request the chairpersons to be here: Dr. Anil, Dr. Uh, Kapoor. Dr. Diksha, I think, hasn't come as yet. And uh, why don't you join? Dr. Parveen Sain is here. No, I don't see her. She'll be joining us in a short while. My presentation is already loaded from three years ago. Yes, it is there. Yeah. OK, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabina, for your kind words, as well as uh, uh, for your invitation to this uh, instruction course. Uh, I am uh, feel so proud. In fact, uh, maybe Diksha is the first one uh, who started uh, doing ROP uh, as far as when uh, I started sort of uh, uh, training people with me. Uh, I think she, I was just trying to recollect, but you are the first one. Uh, <laughs> and uh, subsequently, of course, uh, it's a journey itself. Uh, I do have financial disclosure uh, these days. I do uh, uh, serve as a speaker as well as sometime a consultant to Bayer and uh, El Argan. Uh, so basically coming to, since she wanted me to share a little bit of my journey with ROP, my journey with ROP started in 1989 in Baltimore, Maryland, USA, where I was doing my virtual retinal fellowship. And I started screening and treatment of ROP in PGI Chandigarh. That is where I worked all my life uh, in July 1991, th th when I came back. At that time, there was no awareness of ROP among ophthalmologists, pediatricians, neonatologists, obstetrician, even the parents, nurses. I mean, it used to be one line of uh, lentil fibroplasia uh, somewhere. So uh, for me, uh, uh, the father of uh, ROP in India is uh, Lingam Gopal, because he was the first one who started when Probably I started seeing these babies in USA. He started seeing in India. And I remember when he came in 1990 with his first poster of Coloboma RD to the academy, he told me that he, I, I should concentrate more on ROP. He started seeing some cases. We, well, we are contemporary. We did our residency together in PGI. He's a PGI product also. And this is way back. We did one course uh, in Agra, AIUS, which was full uh, hall. So over a year, we have grown uh, uh, as, and so uh, is probably the specialty. So uh, it's really, I, I, I consider him as the father of ROP in India. I, I used to do initial documentation with video indirect. There was no way. And I, I'll tell you, uh, it was very interesting for me. Those days, these images were shared by not people in India, by across some of the celebrities I don't want to name, from China, from uh, uh, Indonesia, 
and even from Vietnam, they all used to take all these by slide because the, the, that, that time hardly these images were available and these were all video indirect images. And you know, it's very coincidental that cryo ROP study results came in 1989 and that is at the time I started seeing them in USA. And when I came back, I did cryotherapy for threshold disease from 91 till 97. And it used to be done under GA, difficult time. Even our anesthesiologists, they used to be very angry with me. What have you started? They will take half a day for one baby to be in and out. It was a, such a challenge. So lot changed from 97 onwards. I did laser because we could acquire our first laser, diode laser. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, now the lasers are continuing still. Uh, you can see uh, this was 95, this twins, I cryoed. You can see very well uh, that the cryo scars. I, I think I've used to cover very well. You can see here the arcade are written narrow. The vision, despite being one high myope, another one is not that high myope, uh, is 6'6. Six, six. And they are both pursuing and uh, brilliant girls. So, so during my entire journey, 90% of the thesis, uh, I, I think, of course, Savina's thesis were different, the diabetic <laughs> retinopathy. But after that, I don't think I did, uh, I, there was any other thesis except it was uh, ROP only. And this gave me a lot of opportunity, especially to look at ROP relevant to our country and to the most developing world. That is what I feel very good about, that whatever work little we could contribute is totally relevant to our needs. So this is the first one. Uh, first thesis I gave way back in 91, 92 uh, to Rohit Charan. He doesn't do, he's in Jaipur. And this was a first prospective study and back to back that time, me and Lingam Gopal published first time. And the incidence, his was a retrospective hour. So this is in IGO uh, in 95. And you can see the problem was as big as in Western countries, 38%, 47.27%. And this is my, the most uh, kind of important thesis of life, because this was my observation that higher birth weight babies are developing more and more ROP. And this I gave to Anand Vinegar, the famous Anand Vinegar. And so he stayed with us, with me for six years. And you know, this is the paper. I think you will have to work very hard to reach the citation of this paper. It has on Scopus 124 citation. Google Scholar more than 200. So for a paper on ROP, you will have great difficulty having this, that many citations. So that, uh, not only that, it helped to change the guidelines for our country. You see, that is how we could convince. Pediatrician, neonatologists were not convinced. And that's how we came to two kg in 34 weeks rather than following the Western guidelines. Also, this was uh, by great difficulty. I had this elderly parents handicapped and their only girl child uh, couldn't be taken out of the incubator. That's how I started and treated that baby in the incubator through the wall, through the wall and lasered through the wall. And this came as a great uh, uh, tool during uh, COVID times. Even on, based on this, they started receiving more citations because they started making contraptions. They do did make uh, many of them uh, for this. So sometimes your contribution plays a great role. Another thing which bothered me, first diode laser 97, we could get with great difficulty. We used to have green laser and uh, we were sure that green laser should work equally well. But the problem was that Western country would say diode only. That was a problem. So first time we did collect our, our laser conked off. Once the laser conked off, we had to do something. So we started. And that time Anand was there. That's how Anand is still part of that paper up there. And uh, we published uh, then in BGO 2010. You see, it worked equally well with whatever uh, was said earlier, if there is a TVL, there's hemorrhage, there'll be cataract, there's no. And the results were similar to the diode, we compared it. And later on, I, I told them to compile this before my retirement in 2019 in the IGO month, bigger series, so that we have a full confidence. Today that laser, one laser, which is used for all other needs is used for ROP. You see, that is the biggest need of all developing countries where you can't say the diode laser is required separately for this kind of thing. Then also another observation I had that most of our cases, they were aggressive pussy ROP, especially coming from periphery. And that was not so. The investment country was quite small. 
So when they change, previous to this classification, this 2009 Retina paper was the first one. This was even before uh, Dressner and Michael Tracy uh, had a paper in 2010, subsequently, that because we had more cases. And we highlighted this point that there are higher birth weight babies, and that is what subsequently even we put uh, uh, we published in AGO regarding who develops retinal detachment, and also then we thought why not to publish this? The last paper is uh, now having is receiving more citations because many of them they are developing once they are more than 1500 grams. This hybrid ROP I used to write on the file. This was by drawing. I was not able to kind of mixed ROP, something I used to write. So all the time, uh, first Anand, and then uh, Gaurav came with me, and then in, in between, I, I also uh, had a few others, those who, uh, they would say, and you have drawn it differently. I said, I, they don't fit anywhere. So I named myself a hybrid ROP, and uh, sent it for publication to BGO. This is one publication which didn't receive any revision or uh, any kind of thing, they accepted straight away. So you see, today I feel proud. This is one of the papers which changed your new classification. They never wanted, there was a debate. They never wanted to name it as hybrid, so they changed it to aggressive ROP. So this is based on this paper, So which is a great uh, achievement, at least uh, for me, for an observation. This is posterior zone one. This is another one. We have this uh, zone half, whatever. And this is the only full publication. You'll find either a part of other papers earlier before this, and I think then uh, uh, Anil and others have published, uh, looking at this only. But this also, they did debate, but I'm surprised why they didn't include this posterior zone one. They included posterior zone two. Yeah. But what is the importance here is, you must realize that more, almost 80%, 79% of them had unfavorable outcome with laser in our setup. That is why we wanted to publish it. So they need early aggressive uh, multi-modality treatment, I think that is why, ultimately, we landed up into, since she wanted me to talk about also how we have reached, is uh, anti-VEGF for ROP. And once the anti-VEGF came, we know zone one and AP ROP always had a problem. So many of them, they have become indications now for uh, the, the um, anti-VEGFs. And disease may progress despite laser. We have seen this. These days, we tend to do also in many of them surgery, lens sparing and uh, rescue therapy when ophthalmologists are not available. And then lens sparing vitrectomy is something which is very, very close to my heart. I think I, I have done quite a bit of lens sparing vitrectomy. You can see one such case here where we could salvage the... And then this is my last part of uh, the journey there, uh, partial insertion of the cannulas. And just do that, you will not uh, touch the retina ever. And of course, the nasal, all nasal, this has been described first time by me. This was the last one published in Retina 20. And you do in the temporal RD, you save the lens all the time. That is what you need to do. Here you put cannula in the center and go from the side. I'm not showing you the video. And of course, uh, stage five always bothered me. And uh, we published in ophthalmic epidemiology because of this reason I must have gone. I never refused anywhere, wherever I was called all my career of more than 30 years in ROP all over India. I went even to remote areas uh, just to uh, make people. And uh, we were part of the editorial, me and Anand, along with our uh, neonatology professor, Datta, and Raghuveer, who's from very passionate from USA. Uh, we wrote an editorial, what are the causes? So I could have 54 publications, conducted workshops. I am one of the uh, National Task Force members. Lot of lectures. 18 orations I got on ROP. So these are all the National Task Force members here. So you can see these are nominated by the government, uh, Ministry, uh, Government of India. So I could interact with all the big people. I became friendly with them. You can see here Michael Tracy. You can see in the center there Michael Chang. You see he is the director of NEI now these days. Uh, a very uh, a great person, lot of work done by him. And you can see also Michael Subiru down. So, I think here, starting with Subina, she's in the corner. Uh, all, they worked with me. They all practice uh, ROP. There are many more. I, I, I didn't have pictures here. And here is, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Diksha also on the other side. There, and she does a lot of uh, ROP work. And uh, she is the one who's carrying on along with Simmer down there. Uh, so even when I retired, they had a full issue on ROP. 
dedicated to me with the editorial written by Santosh that this is because uh, I worked in that area and most of the articles I was part of when they wrote for Indian Pediatrics full supplement. There is something to do with my institution and uh, ROP. You know, all the stalwarts here, they have been all product of PGI Chandigarh. That is where I worked all my life. And you can see these are the people. They have made whole difference as far as the ROP is concerned. So thank you very much, friends. I thought it will serve as little stimulation for some of you, those who are here early morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that lovely lecture. Uh, I would invite Dr. Uh, Kapoor for his talk on screening of ROP. Thank you, Dr. Subhina. Uh, thank you really very much for making me part of this instruction course. Um, so the, ma the basic um, uh, thing about this instruction course is how to set up a ROP clinic, and my role here is to discuss about the screening. So other than the usual dry part uh, that when should screening be done, I'll share some of mm -hmm. my personal experiences so, so about uh, screening and setting up of a ROP clinic. So just a brief introduction about myself. I'm a veterinary consultant at three hospitals, and I visit about six uh, NICUs for doing ROP screening, and equal if not more number of NICUs refer patients to me where I cannot go. Uh, what is my experience in setting up of RP service, services? Uh, way back in 2006, I had set up a Site Savers International program for ROP in Delhi. And then I introduced ROP services to p south of Punjab in 2007 when Dr. Dogra was called to introduce those services. And then I've also taken over a few NICUs where the practices were really not very ethical. Uh, last year, I have screened about 733 kids and um, Laser alone was done in about uh, 46, anti-VGF followed by laser 21. So majority of the kids were lasered only. So this is just a background uh, so that I can establish my credibility that why I am speaking on this topic today. Uh, these are a few pictures from the OPD. Uh, this is ultra-modern NICU in a tier two city in Punjab. So why do we need to screen? Whom to screen, when to screen, how to screen? The importance of screening is that a timely screening can prevent ROP blindness in 90% of cases. And it's been proved now with ample number of publications that it is one of the most cost-effective health interventions that has been done in this century. And most of the screening guidelines have been taken from the Rashtra Bal Suraksha Karikram, NNF, a Public Health Foundation of India, and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. They have all worked together to give us these guidelines. And as Dr. Dogra has just said, that Indian guidelines are a little different from the European or American guidelines. So whom to screen? All the infants which are born with birth weight less than 1750 grams should be screened. However, this figure was raised further to 2000 grams by RBSK in 2017. Babies born less than 34 weeks, all these babies should be screened. However, babies between 34 to 36 should also be screened if their initial neonatal period has been stormy. And pediatrician is to take this call. However, let us be sure and be aware that we are seeing a lot of ROP even in this group, 34 to 36. I have lasered them, I have injected them. I don't know what is being done in NICU, but I feel that had these kids not gone to the NICU, they would have done much better. So if we had followed American guidelines, we would have caught just about 83% of the kids in India. And if we had followed British guidelines, we would have followed 77% of kids. And this is again from the paper which Dr. Dogra just quoted, which he has published. It was established in this paper that 16.1% of the babies were greater than 1750 grams. 6.5%, if you um, uh, extrapolate it to the lakhs of kids which need screening in India, see the mind-boggling numbers that will come out, they were greater than 2,000 grams. Hence, these guidelines were framed. And again, tw about 23% babies were more than 32 weeks of gestation age. So for the babies which are born equal to or less than 28 weeks, their first screening should be done about two weeks after birth. And for babies born between 29 and 34 weeks, the first screening is between th the third and fourth week of birth. This two weeks after birth actually helps uh, because these babies, of course, they develop ROP earlier than the other babies, but also because of the fact that you can catch them early and you can 
hammer upon the fact to the parents that these babies need to be followed up later on so that they are not missed because these are the highest risk cases. The initial screening, of course, is to be done in the NICU where the baby is admitted. Once the, once the baby is discharged, then it can be seen in your own OPD or clinic. And if you are a busy practitioner, then it is better to uh, tell the pediatrician to send these babies to you instead of you wasting your time going to the, their clinic to seeing these babies. And these days, of course, telescreening is in now and it can be done. It is equivalent, again, papers have proved it, it is equivalent to indirect ophthalmoscope if a good uh, technician does these images. Uh, I'll be showing this little video about dilating the pupils later on. However, just to tell that uh, drops need to be diluted, one is to one dilution. And if you are just seeing about one or two or three babies in your clinic, then these uh, diluted drops can be taken in the one cc range in which you have dilated. If the number of babies is more, then it is better to prepare in an uh, eye drop bottle. And little nitty gritties of ROP screening is that preferably in your own OPD you should have a, a dedicated area for uh, ROP screening where these uh, mothers, parents or kids can be seated. This, these help uh, because adequate temperature can be maintained. Usually our OPDs have ACs and these babies need to be kept in a little warm environment. And where the, these parents, they sit, they can interact with each other, mothers can feed the child. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, babies are referred from across various cities. And so once they are all seated in a similar area, they interact with each other, that parents, they develop confidence, okay, this doctor is right for, for our baby. There are so many other pediatricians who are referring the babies to them. If they're sitting in a general OPD like we are sitting here, then they're sitting aloof, some, aloof somebody is in the front seat, somebody is the back, they cannot interact. And feed should be given about one hour prior to the examination so that the baby doesn't vomit or aspirate. And uh, there's another uh, controversial aspect about taking the consent for screening because there have been some uh, mishaps where the babies have died or something during screening process also. Uh, to be honest, I have, not, uh, I have not been taking consent for screening, but I think uh, it is a need, especially in the metro cities. Uh, these babies uh, should be given top priority in your OPD. There may be any adult patient who may be making a ruckus or throwing tantrums, but no, he doesn't need to be seen first. These babies need to be seen first and uh, uh, discharged from your uh, OPD. Document your findings nicely. And old findings should be accessible at each follow-up visit. Don't think that the parents will every time bring the papers, they will forget the papers because they have to carry the baby, the feeding bottle, so many other things, they may forget the papers. So you should also have a copy in your OPD, in your record, which you can pull out and see what were your findings in the last visit. Teach your staff how to handle these babies gently and how to calculate the gestation age and post-conceptional age after talking to the parents and use sterilized instruments every time because otherwise if you are seeing a lot of babies you can you can yourself uh, introduce an iatrogenic conjunctivitis uh, thing like like cluster end of you will have a cluster conjunctivitis and once this conjunctivitis enters a nicu believe me it takes months and months for it to go out so uh, as we were saying that this uh, IC is about setting up of ROP clinic. So initially when you're setting up this ROP clinic, never say no to ROP screening. I see about 50 adult patients every day in my OPD. I do three to four VR surgeries, but at night when I'm going home, when there's a call, I make it a point to go to that ICU, see the baby. So th this is how your credibility will be established in your own area in your city. And once you're talking to the parents, never hesitate from using the words like lifelong blindness because that is what will hammer upon the, uh, your uh, thing to their mind that, that, okay, this baby needs to be follow up. Otherwise, they can get tired from follow ups, they can miss the follow ups. And once you're talking to the pediatricians, always cite the medical legal cases which have gone against the doctors. And you can explain the disease to the parents by showing reference fundus pictures if you do not have a fundus camera. And Last point here is that don't try to fight with the system. There will be neonatologists or so-called neonatologists, self-declared neonatologists who are not doing things right in NICUs. However, don't try to fight with them. It is, it's too late for them to understand you. Rather, you become friendly with them, enter into the system, and try to alleviate this blindness. Try to finish off this blindness by doing your best. This is a uh, small video about dilating the drops. Hand hygiene has to be told to the staff very nicely. So he here we have two staff members. 
one is opening the eyelids and another is putting these diluted drops i have seen sometimes it's a single staff who is uh, himself trying to open the eyes and trying to put the drops and that really does not work the drops spill out or he can uh, injure the cornea so at least have two members one will open the eyes one will instill the drops This is the usual uh, instrument which we use for screening. It is Alfonso type speculum, so wire vectors for depression, 28 and 20 diopter lenses. The baby is swaddled nicely so the baby doesn't move. It is a misconception that screening takes a lot of time. So many people avoid screening. They say in that much time we can see four or five adult patients. It's a total misconception. Now you see from the time I have put in the speculum, you can see, you can count on your stopwatches how much time it takes to see one eye. It's just a matter of training. So I've already examined about 180 degrees, the temporal part. And that's it. At the end of your screening, put one drop of antibiotics. There is no need to prescribe antibiotics. I have seen people prescribe antibiotics for five days, 10 days. Believe me, there's no need for that. While we are uh, doing the screening, we need to uh, see uh, in which zone the disease is, what is the stage of the disease, extent, presence or absence of the plus disease. I will not be going into this, these details. This is a um, uh, figure uh, diagram with which all of you are very well aware, showing us the zones. Thank you very much for your kind hearing. And with the end of this talk, I invite anyone who is interested in learning ROP screening or laser, they can come and contact me. Now it's time to pass on the baton to the younger generation. Thank you. Very good, uh, uh, Ajay. Uh, I know uh, how much hard you have worked, and he was uh, first one in the Punjab area, and that he really worked uh, up right from the time he had invited me to his center and uh, how much, uh, how many babies he has saved. So thank you, thank you Anil for giving your uh, uh, input into this particular area. Now uh, it's going to be our chief instructor, uh, Dr. Subina Narang. Uh, she's going to be, she's a professor in medical college, uh, Chandigarh. And uh, you know, uh, she's going to give us the classification as well as some case based, uh, uh, showing some cases. Dr. Subina, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Now I'll be talking about the latest classification which is given in 2021 and a few cases, ROP cases in, uh, 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 along with the classification. So why do we want to classify ROP? That is to give one common disease language so that we can classify, document and identify ROP leading treatment. The first classification was given in 1984 which classified ROP on the basis of location of ROP and extent of ROP. In 1987, it was uh, retinal detachment was included in the same classification. In 2005, there was revision and we added aggressive retinopathy of prematurity to it because we were having more and more of aggressive cases. In 2021, we have revised this classification because we have newer imaging techniques and better treatment facilities and better neonatal survival. So we have a few modifications which have been made. Now ICROP uh, 2021, the location is practically the same, zone one ROP, we all know. With disc at the center, you draw a circle, the radius of which is twice the distance between the uh, disc and the macula. And in case in your busy clinical setting, you cannot identify what is zone one, then you take 28 diopter lens. If the edge of the disc, nasal edge of the disc, is coming at the edge of the field of your 28 diopter lens, the area, whatever you are visualizing is zone one ROP. 
area beyond it to this diameter is called posterior zone to ROP, especially to take care of the babies like Sir was showing. The heavier babies and older babies in India are having aggressive ROP in zone two, uh, zone two posterior ROP. And then from the nasal part of the zone one till the nasal ora serrata is zone two ROP. And the temporal crescent which is left is zone three ROP. Now the, uh, they've also added a term notch. Notch is in case we see that there's uh, incursion of the uh, ROP lesions in the posterior zone for one to two clock hours. In these kind of cases, we document is like zone one secondary to the notch. So this notch be a very careful examination will show this notch is a notch in some cases. You have, this is how you have to document that. And now coming to the uh, uh, severity of ROP, if you see a line between the avascularized retina and avascularized retina, this is stage one ROP. You could see some uh, arteriovenous malformations just in, uh, posterior to this line. If this line gets a volume, it is stage two ROP. If you do fluorescein angiography here, you will pick up some arteriovenous shunt vessels. And if this gets a, uh, there's raised extra retinal proliferation, fibrovascular proliferation, you will see that the posterior part of this is in continuation with the uh, fibrovascular tissue there. And these are perpendicular to the ridge. So this is what it is. If your retina is detached, stage 4A if the macula is paired and stage 4B if your macula is involved. And if you have total retinal detachment, it is stage 5. If the bedside examination, you are able to see the optic disc, then it is 5A. If optic disc is not visible, it is 5B. And in case anterior segment is involved, it is 5C ROP. You must carefully examine the junction of vascular and avascular retina. If at junction you are able to pick flat neovascularization, it is aggressive ROP. If these babies are not treated in time, then this would straight away lead to stage five ROP, and it doesn't pass through various stages of ROP. We are seeing this kind of aggressive ROP even in anterior zone. Now this is this uh, law of dilatation and tortuosity of vessel, and this is zone two ROP. And once you carefully examine, there's neovascularization, flat neovascularization here, which is aggressive retinopathy of prematurity. This has also given a new dimension to PLUS disease. Now it is, the PLUS disease is called a continuous spectrum of retinal vascular changes. Increased vascular dilatation and tortuosity could be in the form of pre-PLUS disease. It's a continuous dilatation and tortuosity or PLUS disease. You have to see the posterior zone one in totality and see how much dilatation and tortuosity is there. Now this is the patient who comes to us. There's a lot of dilatation and tortuosity of vessels and one hemorrhage which is there we do fluorescein angiography to see whether this patient has flat neovascularization. We are missing, but there's no flat neovascularization. The patient progresses, and you start seeing neovascularization. The careful examination show. However, just to document, we did fluorescein angiography, which is showing leakage here. So this is aggressive ROP, which you have to treat. Now, after treatment, you start seeing regression of ROP. The classification also comments about the regression. Uh, the regression could be seen there's decrease in dilatation and tortuosity, which we are seeing after laser treatment in this patient. It could be seen after anti-VEGF also. In anti-VEGF, the regression is one to three days, and with laser treatment, it is seven to 14 days. The vascularization, uh, well, there could be persistent avascular uh, retina after regression, especially with anti-VEGF. If you have to document that, you have to document the zone in which you are seeing posterior uh, persistent avascular area. Here it is pers persistent avascular zone three. The vascular changes of ROP uh, uh, could show reactivation on the time you are following up these babies, especially after anti-VEGF agents. You start seeing the vascular dilatation and tortuosity again. You will see frail neovascular fronts. They could be hemorrhages around those neovascular fronts. So careful examination has to be done for reactivation of ROP. And if multiple ridges are present, especially after anti-VEGF treatment, you will add a modifier. Reactivated is applied to the most anterior edge what you would be seeing. You could see this kind of reactivation after laser also. This patient was uh, taken up for laser treatment as well as uh, uh, anti-VEGF treatment. At three weeks follow-up, you see this dilatation and tortuosity has decreased, so it looks good. But once the patient comes back for follow-up, there's reactivation in the form of ridge coming up again. So you have to really maintain the follow-up in these babies till the time you see total regression. And then again, 
for sequelae of ROP. This is a lifelong follow-up for any ROP baby. If ca in case you have reactivation, just try looking for these avascular areas or skip lesions which could be left behind. So you have to address these areas for complete regression of ROP. Long-term sequelae of ROP, apart from the foveal, shallow foveal rape or persistence of inner layers of fovea, there are other things which happen uh, due to residual peripheral traction areas. They could be macular drag, disc drag, there could be straightening of vessels, and you could pick up certain things on uh, macula also. This was stage 4B ROP. We've done uh, fairly good treatment, happy with our treatment. Once the patient is maintaining follow-up, four years follow-up, the patient starts showing this lesion in the macula. However, the vision continues to be 2060, which is a good vision. But you do f OCT for this baby, there's this uh, looks like probably a spontaneous closure of macular hole. So now we've seen that if you do laser treat, uh, if you do uh, vitrectomy, you must maintain the follow-up. You do have some macular problems which are coming up late during the follow-up. Summarizing, ECROP3 should be followed to describe and document ROP. It is an integral part of any ROP evaluation. Classification gives uniformity in describing location and severity of the disease. The documentation as per ECROP3 is must in the present scenario Pl uh, plus the medical legal issues will also be, disc in, uh, uh, will be discussed subsequently in this course, you will realize that it's very important to document, document, and document, even whether the d drops are dilated or not, uh, the pupils are dilated or not dilated, how you have examined, and you have to give the next date. This is the performer which we follow in our practice. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Subina, for giving uh, such a clear understanding especially about the new classification which we all have to follow and uh, how uh, we should be uh, documenting each and everything. Yeah, even if we don't have uh, cameras, we can always have uh, good diagrams and uh, you label it very well. Good morning, everyone. I thank Dr. Subina for a very nice talk as well as inviting me here to be a part of uh, this very prestigious team who's doing a very uh, dedicated team who's doing a lot of work on uh, ROP. So from, uh, I take it further to the role of anti VEGFN laser in the treatment of ROP. So as Dr. Subina has mentioned earlier, this is the stage one uh, disease of retinopathy of prematurity. So when you have either an immature retina or you have a stage one demarcation line is visible and what you do is a one to two weekly follow-up. Once you see stage two, it needs definitely a weekly follow-up and once stage three is there you must treat within 24 to 48 hours if you see something like this that there is a flat neovascularization without any obvious ridge formation you have to treat even further earlier which is uh, within 24 hours and if you have aggressive rop at your hand as described by the previous speaker we need urgent treatment this is because the zone 1 ROP and zone 2 ROP may actually be two different, uh, ha have two different underlying pathogenesis where zone 1 is very aggressive and there is no formation of demarcation line because there is inhibition of normal vasculogenesis as well. So this is the indication of treatment which has been given to us by ET ROP and we generally follow this only a little bit where we can have some controversy regarding treatment. ET ROP has mentioned that stage 3 zone 2 you could follow but most of us feel that these patients may get lost to follow up and so we definitely would still either follow them up closely or go ahead and treat so once you have decided that you're going to treat these children how do you do it you have to have bilaterally pupillary dilatation the procedure and drops has been covered well with dr ajay and make sure the child is fasting for about 30 to 45 minutes not too long because you're going to do treatment under topical anesthesia Unlike the Western uh, countries where the treatment is done under sedation or general anesthesia, if you plan to do that for some reason, then the uh, fasting has to be more. Otherwise, half an hour, 45 minutes is enough because during treatment, if the child cries too much, it will be again uh, causing hypoglycemia. Informed consent, very important, which will probably be taken care later as well. And a quick general, uh, general exam by either the anesthetist, and if you don't have really an anesthetist with you, just go through the previous discharge summary which the patient is carrying from the uh, uh, NICU because that will tell you what other issues that the baby has had and it will give you some indication as to what you can expect. So laser photocoagulation, indirect laser photocoagulation is required and as Dr. Dogra has mentioned that dio laser 
or a normal uh, 532 MB YAG laser can be done. This is a regular laser which we have in the OPD which we are using for all the other diseases of retina. We use it here as well. So this is a little uh, small video which shows that how we are going to saddle the baby. First we actually we do it in the operation theater under the care of an anesthetist and uh, so the ECG leads everything is in place it is uh, applied so that you can monitor the baby the pacifier is just during this procedure and uh, so that the child does, uh, doesn't cry while we are preparing the child and once this has been done then uh, you can see already the baby is dilated just and monitoring on the uh, voils operators and the monitor are available and here you just uh, follow it up with paracaine drops and then we apply a pediatric wire rectus uh, is used along with the speculum and the laser treatment is carried out. Once the we start laser in the pacifier, we generally I prefer it that the baby is crying and this we remove it. And uh, this is uh, the sorry. Yeah, so this is uh, as uh, Sir mentioned that we had taken cue from his treatment of doing laser through the incubator and during COVID when we had this similar issue where right in the very beginning we didn't know how it was spreading COVID and what we had to do yet ROP laser had to be done. So we created something called the aerosol box which is uh, again uh, almost like a thick plastic transparent container and the baby was put in that and we could easily achieve indirect laser photocoagulation through this. So this reduced the contamination of the full OR as well as exposure of the treating doctor to this and is this uh, aerosol box in addition was also connected to a uh, tube which used to take away the vapors or the uh, suction tube and used to be um, uh, put into the suction apparatus so that it doesn't the vapors or the exhalation of the child doesn't go to the atmosphere. So this is what we did initially during our initial stages of COVID when we didn't have any vaccination or anything. So laser treatment technique near confluent burns, gray, uh, light gray creamy burns are placed and avoid treatment to the ridge in the first go. And if you are going to treat, then you prefer diode so that the uh, hemorrhages and all are not there. But sometimes these hemorrhages can occur if you directly treat the ridge. So avoid it in the first sitting. This shows very nice how it can regress and almost 94 to 95% of the cases do regress. Zone 1, it may come down to 60 to 70% regression rates, but still it can happen. And within 24 hours, you will see regression, especially of the plus disease. It can come by 2 to 3 weeks, you will see normal vessels growing up to the aura. So when do you retreat? So if you see skip areas or you see that the posterior ridge is forming behind the previous laser burns or a localized TRD, then you have to go in again, take a call and uh, treat. Side effects you could have is interior segment ischemia, hyphemia, hyphema or cataract and uh, posterior segment accidental macular burn. So this should not happen but the, since the baby is moving it may happen initially in few stages but best you make all precautions to avoid it. And since the peripheral loss can happen more so that is where the anti come into play. This is just sharing an example that inadequate treatment can sometimes result in a local kind of TRD in the area which has had skip area with laser and not been treated. This was one uh, rare example which I came with the baby came from outside and had had heavy laser and in periphery or interior to the heavy laser there was dialysis and had to undergo steel buckling for uh, reattachment. So as I mentioned, zone 1 or aggressive ROP, which does not respond very well to laser, anti vegf comes into play. And increased use of anti vegf was particularly seen in COVID because again, reduced the amount of time spent doing the laser. So just quickly to uh, show you that the beat ROP and uh, rainbow studies have shown that uh, uh, anti vegf both bevacizumab, ranibizumab and the newer one now aflibacep is also useful and it reduces both important thing to remember it reduces normal vascularization as well in addition to pathological vascularization so the importance has to be given to the dose which is given normally we are giving half to one third of the dose but there are studies which have said that even uh, lesser than that can be uh, used and it can be effective but the problem is if you use a very less dose you will have to dilute the uh, the drug which is usually not a good idea so one third to half the normal adult dose is enough this is the examination, the injection kit which you should have before you start the baby 
with the injection and a small video to show you how we do it in the clinic which you can also follow so again the swaddling of the child has to be done and again you if you can uh, take care with the ecg leads so that your heart rate and everything is continuously monitored to reduce the movement we just gently uh, take care that the baby is uh, wrapped up nicely and cleaning is done with povidone iodine and then you can uh, just drape the child with the single drape and the eye only is exposed again use the speculum to retract the lids after using paracaine drops this is a case of tunica vasculosa uh, which is persistent and you can see that the eye is moving that is because the treatment is only under topical anesthesia and the baby is crying so you really have to be very quick this is almost a real time video and is not an edited version and you can see that uh, you know uh, once you measured 1.5 mm from the limbus we just go in with a 30 or 32 gauge needle straight in and inject and you can see this bleb coming gentle whitening is visible because of a transient increase in iop but you need not do paracentesis this is a very small volume of the drug which will be disseminated and iop will be normal so this is uh, as i said safer rop has now uh, laid down these guidelines it should be a shorter needle antiseptic follow-up of two to seven days extra detail to attention to detail and recheck follow-up follow-up and follow-up is extremely important when you are doing anti vegf treatment and especially if you're not combining with laser you can do it in the NICU setting as well as in the operation theater but in the NICU you have to be even more careful regarding the sterile conditions advantages you always have a, a pediatrician or a, a trained help in uh, at bay so that you can call whenever is required bilateral injection if possible avoid but then more and more people are doing it to avoid uh, uh, any delay in treatment anti vegf can be particularly useful in aggressive forms of rop and if especially uh, they present with exudative detachment this was one of our cases where it was so extensive that there was exudative detachment laser was not a possibility and anti vegf worked very well disadvantage major recurrences can be seen after anti vegf and then uh, uh, crunch phenomena can be seen inadequate and peripheral uh, vascularization is incomplete so this will need attention sometimes total shutdown of blood vessels are possible so a combination of treatments of using anti vegf as well as laser is again something which we all doing it more and more often and this works very well even as a rescue therapy so to summarize we must treat rop uh, as per the most current recommendations and you must keep all uh, up to date to these recommendations oral and written consent you have to talk to the patient and tell and the parents as to what to expect anti vegf whenever is chosen you have to emphasize the need for follow-up and combination therapy definitely should be thought about in our scenario where the patients cannot keep up a long-term follow-up thank you thank you dr Perpine, for such a, a nice talk and such elaborate discussion i'm uh, so happy to look at this talk very nice thank you now i would invite dr diksha uh, for her talk on surgical aspect of ROP. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Subina, ma'am, for the opportunity. Uh, I'm feeling honored to present surgery for ROP in front of Professor Dogra and Dr. Praveen herself, who I think spent a lifetime uh, in this field. Uh, so please, uh, inputs are welcome from everyone, and any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. So uh, I'll be talking on, uh, can I, uh, is the slide shown here? Surgery for ROP. So as the Praveen ma'am just mentioned that uh, if you do a good laser and a timely laser or an anti-VEGF uh, which is given timely, uh, you know, uh, most of them, uh, most of the ROP cases will do very, very well. So for uh, zone one ROP or say 70 to 80 percent will do very well uh, with the treatment of laser uh, and or anti-VEGF. And uh, if you talk of high risk pre-threshold, nearly 100 percent of them will likely regress with laser alone, uh, provided the treatment is done timely. However, uh, despite uh, all this, uh, nearly 12% of eyes can progress to retinal detachment due to proliferative uh, retinopathy as per the ETROP ET study. And uh, in our country especially, late presentations with advanced disease, uh, stage 4B, 5 are common because of lack of uh, screening facilities which are universal. So when do you require surgery for ROP? So surgery for ROP is mostly required for stage 4A, 
I have shown the photographs 4B and 5. Also, we have now seen some atypical cases and these are less responsive to the conventional treatment. So some of these atypical presentations and also we like to go in little early. So any progressive fibrovascular organization, despite you thinking that there is an adequate treatment that has been done and media opacities will be indications for surgery. The surgical approaches include scleral buckling, length sparing vitrectomy and lensectomy vitrectomy. Scleral buckle has a decent uh, success rate in stage 4, almost close to 70%, 40% for stage 5. The problem with it is the induced uh, anisometropia, which kind of uh, dampens the visual outcomes of, uh, that are related to the scleral buckle. And also, it requires a second procedure, which is the buckle di division to allow growth of the eyeball. Um, when you have to do a scleral buckle, most of the time it's a 240 band. You identify the area of the traction and it is supported uh, 240 band almost applied close to the limbus either with sutures. But uh, if you can do a scleral dissection, then you can avoid the sutures in all quadrants. Uh, I don't have very long experience with scleral buckles, but yes, a few of them uh, which I have done recently. Uh, uh, apart from this, uh, recently I had a re very challenging case of a rheumatogenous retinal detachment and outborn referred with the prior history of laser and anti-VEGF zone 1 AROP. You can see this full thickness retinal break just at this border of zone 1 and the whole of the posterior pole was detached. Though uh, uh, immediate laser photocoagulation to the vascular retina as well as to the edges of the break was done, it, you can see that the laser uptake was poor and that was because of the fluid. Almost the, it's, uh, this is a two-dimensional photograph, but the entire posterior pole was detached. I really wanted to avoid putting silicon oil because this is a rheumatogenous retinal detachment, not a tractional one. So I thought that I wanted to do a buckle, but a circumferential buckle would not cover this posterior break. So I tried to uh, do a different approach. Uh, one of my professors suggested that why don't you try a radial buckle. So using a 505 uh, sponge, uh, I marked the position of the retinal break uh, on indirect and then using vertical mattress sutures, I secured the sponge uh, uh, to cover the posterior break uh, with two sutures and one anterior. And I did not do any retinal uh, drainage of subretinal fluid because the peripheral retina was already lasered and attached and there was no way I could reach up to where the fluid was. So I just put that uh, indent outside and uh, it worked, um, thankfully. So this is the post-operative uh, photograph of this patient. We can see there is resolution of the fluid and the retina attached. We had to do the removal of the buckle, which was done around six weeks. Lens sparing vitrectomy is the most common surgery which is performed for retinopathy of prematurity. Initially de de described by Dr. Michael Tracy, which was a two-port system using an infusing light pipe in one hand and a forceps or a cutter in the other hand. Nowadays, most of us are doing a three-port conventional vitrectomies and uh, that, that's just to allow change of hands between uh, if you have to go from the nasal to the temporal side without inducing any transient hypotony. The success rates are good, 60 to 85 percent. 23, 25, 27 gauge all can be used. I personally use most of the time 27 gauge uh, vitrectomy and in select cases as, uh, I use the 25. So the anatomical considerations considering the smaller axial length and the larger volume of the lens is that, that we need to go parallel to the visual axis with all our instruments, keep them steady, fix the infusion cannula so that it does not keep moving, does not become horizontal and cause an in is causes an inadvertent lens touch. The sclerotomies have to be made uh, into the pass plicata, which is, uh, and so you have to go around 1.5 millimeters in a child who is less than six months old. And six to 12 months, we can go up to two millimeters, one to two years, 2.5 millimeters, and then three and uh, six years and above, you can go 3.5 millimeters in the normal adults. The timing of surgeries should be ideally when the vascular activity has gone, but sometimes that may not be possible because of the rapid progression. So we need to give adjuncts in the form of anti-VEGF just prior to surgery. One thing is that the laser-treated eyes tend to have a more posterior proliferative change, so they are more amenable to lens sparing vitrectomy, whereas the untreated eyes, because they have a more peripheral traction, most of the time may require a sacrifice of the lens. So this is uh, a video of a uh, 27-gauge lens sparing vitrectomy for progressive ROP, showing the steps of the surgery. I hope we have the audio for this. Presented with birth eye aggressive retinopathy of prematurity in zone 1, for which he underwent both eye laser photocoagulation. 
This was the picture one week after laser photocoagulation. There was persistence of plus disease and presence of fibrovascular proliferation along the arcades. So both eye supplemental laser was done and both eye lens bearing vitrectomy was planned with preoperative injection ranibizumab as an adjunct. This was the picture a week after supplemental laser and injection anti-VEGF. We can see that there is reduction of plus disease. However, there is persistence of fibrovascular proliferation along the arcades. We can see the first important step is making of sclerotomy. Sclerotomy is made for infusion cannula 1.5 mm away from the limbus. Conjunctiva is slighted and entry is made perpendicular to the visual axis while avoiding inadvertent injury to the crystalline lens. Similarly, two more sclerotomies are made for endolite and cutter. This is the intraoperative view. The code vitrectomy is now started. The principle of LSV includes release of various vitro-retinal tractional forces as shown in this diagram, which here is synonymous with the fibrous proliferation along the arcades. Here we can see that the adhesion between the ridge and the lens are being removed, followed by release of adhesion between the ridge and the periphery. Intraoperative OCT can be a useful adjunct in ROP surgery. It can help in identifying the membranes and can guide their removal. Triamsmere actinide is added to stain the posterior hyaloid. Even though the complete removal of posterior hyaloid may not be possible in these eyes, here an attempt is made to remove the hyaloid between the arcades. This is followed by fluid air exchange. Any residual peripheral vitreous can now be removed under air. Fluid air exchange also helps in tamponading the pores in case a sutureless vitrectomy is planned, as shown in this case. Now the cannulas are removed and the pores are left sutureless. This is the outcome at 2 months. We can see that there is reduction of plus disease and our kids are now so uh, just to uh, summarize this, the key to doing a transconjunctival sutureless is to first do an adequate conjunctival sliding, pull it up towards towards the limbus, and leave in air. The thing about uh, is that we don't. I mean, it's not very important whether we apply sutures or not. Any given point, we feel that there is a little hypotony please apply sutures. It's just that in my personal experience with 27 gauge, I have not needed to apply sutures in most of my cases, but whenever needed, please do not hesitate in doing so. We need to modify the approach uh, sometimes. Uh, here we can see Professor Dogra. Uh, he has described the stick leaf of an all nasal approach to lens pairing vitrectomy where everything is shifted nasally. The infusion cannula moves in the center and on either side we have ports for the uh, endo illuminator and the vitreous cutter. This is just a small video demonstrating the same for a 4B uh, TRD wherein we did an all nasal approach. Here we see the port placement. We can see that the entire peripheral retina is just behind the lens and there is no way that you could approach it uh, temporally. You could do it with a scleral buckle but uh, here we can see that the intraoperative OCT identifies the membrane that is bridging the two folds and uh, that was uh, needed to uh, you know, uh, we needed to peel these membranes uh, to uh, have a successful outcome, which is uh, seen. Uh, I'll just skip this. And uh, sometimes, uh, rarely, the most dreaded complication is a regmatogenous retinal detachment. Uh, we all dread it and I, we hope that we never have it, but sometimes we may have it and then we need to go all out. We need to put in silicon oil. The problem with silicon oils is the raised uh, chances of uh, glaucoma and we need to do an early removal if possible, though sometimes that may not be possible. So if you can avoid it, well, that's the best case scenario. And prone positioning for infants, I just realized, is not difficult at all. They have a tendency to lie down prone. So uh, I'll just conclude, uh, my time is up. Uh, is that time, should, should I shift if time permits? If Okay, sir. So I'll just show a brief video of uh, stage five, wherein the principle of stage five is that you have to dissect out the uh, retrolental membrane. 
generally proceed from the center to the periphery i'll go straight away generally you will have to approach through the limbus uh, an ac maintainer is placed and uh, you'll have to make limbal ports and uh, lensectomy is most of the time required iris hooks may be required for pupillary dilatation you need to go from the center to the periphery sometimes from the periphery to the center also some people do but again it depends on your personal preference the key is to identify this membrane most of the time the peripheral retina is attached and there is a fibrovascular proliferation bridging the attached retina so we need to identify it and dissect it out carefully with a cutter or with a forceps or and using a scissors so any of these thing instruments can be used so basically this tr uh, trough is dissected out and uh, then uh, I, that's all you don't need to do much and uh, generally the fu funnel opens up and uh, gradually but this that takes time so uh, just to conclude lens sparing small gauge vitrectomy is safe and effective for most cases of rop but when indicated surgery should be done early bilateral surgeries should be considered in cases of uh, bilateral progressive disease in rop and emphasis on prevention timely screening and diagnosis remains crucial uh, still to outcomes for the red rop surgery thank you special thanks to professor dogra because uh, still if i have an issue i send the child over to him and he gives me an opinion <laughs> for uh, i mean al almost like on a daily or a weekly basis thank you any thank question? you diksha thank you any any, any, any co uh, questions comments very well done diksha you are doing wonderful surgeries that's the only comment. Now I'd invite Dr. Anil uh, for the much awaited topic of uh, uh, medical legal aspect in ROP, which we know is very, very important. And we should all must pay attention once we, we are practicing ROP to what he says. So good morning to everyone. And thank you, Dr. Uh, Subina and Professor Dogra for this opportunity. So and the why this is the last presentation that uh, is being kept is uh, none of us should uh, land up in this problem. So that is the first thing that I'd like to tell. But uh, how to avoid that is that, uh, uh, so uh, I think uh, I can see Dr. Samar Agrawal is also there. Uh, we had this uh, night ar nice article that was summarized with uh, Dr. Anand Binekar where uh, Dr. Samarth uh, has nicely summarized all the medical legal litigations that were uh, uh, seen in India over the last uh, one or two decades. And in that uh, article, what we have seen is that uh, uh, most of the litigations were against the pediatrician. However, some of the times, even the uh, ophthalmologist, if not doing appropriate uh, kind of documentation, can uh, see themselves in a problem. So as a pediatrician, I think, though it's not uh, the day uh, preterm babies are admitted to this NICU. Uh, priming of these uh, parents for ROP screening is a role of pediatrician and that helps part of and the ophthalmologist. And if we are practicing ROP screening in India, we have our Indian guidelines and we should stick to them that babies less than 34 weeks and weighing less than 2000 grams should be screened for ROP. And uh, yes, everyone has seen that uh, we see tend to see babies which are larger, they tend to develop a treatable or severe form of ROP. So even larger babies should not be excluded. And any baby that is that has not received oxygen, okay, we should not uh, uh, deny ROP screening for the baby. It might be sometimes, yeah, particularly in SNCUs, we tend to get babies which are actually IUGR and most of the mothers, they are not really literally aware of the EDD. So, uh, ROP screening, even if the pediatrician asks to do for a term baby, we should not hesitate and we should do it rather than missing out because most and most our RBSK guidelines are making it a comprehensive ophthalmic examination rather than just ROP screening. And by any chance, we should not miss out something like uh, retinoblastoma at that age also. So do not uh, hesitate and uh, opt out of the ROP screening. So again, uh, most of the baby or ROP or treatable form of ROP is a disease of sick infants. So it is safe to do ROP screening even if the babies are ventilated. Again, so be confident. You know that the baby is fine and you will be comfortably doing ROP screening. So do it for severe babies. Uh, Dr. Rajay was also talking at our place. We are following this that we take ROP uh, consent for ROP screening as well. And I think it should be a recommended uh, method. 
um, however technically and ideally following it might be difficult but whenever it comes to medical legal uh, implication these are things which would uh, possibly save us if the babies are being seen in our uh, routine ophthalmic ot uh, opd we should be prioritizing them we should say them early uh, than typically waiting them and if we have a specially designated room for such examination that is warm enough or as good as a nicu that is a good thing that we can have again everything that we are doing in nicu has to be followed for in uh, seeing any baby even in our opd also so all aseptic precautions are to be followed babies are best to be uh, seen in nicus if it is possible and all the aseptic precautions are to be uh, taken and explaining the parents uh, if it is a good uh, thing we have a rop team we definitely tend to counsel and uh, it is a good idea to develop a team so that these uh, parents they are primed about need for rop screening the method of rop screening at my place uh, most of our pediatrician and pediatric nurses they tend to prime the parent so they are not worried and they will not be uh, after us if they see the swollen lid after uh, rop screening so their uh, collaboration between the pediatrician and ophthalmologist is must and it's a good idea to inquire about the other twins or uh, in case of multiple gestation what about the other babies sometimes they are not brought for screening we should always get them screened also so again the last i think this is the most important part of any litigation documentation is the most important thing that can save us or it can put us in trouble if had it if, had, uh, if it is being done in a wrong or inappropriate way so i think uh, uh, dr samarth will uh, agree with that uh, some of the litigation that has been laid uh, it was stated that anything which was not written on the nicu notes that means dilatation was not done so we practice that uh, these are pre printed things which are available at our form and the method of examination and dilatation has to be mentioned on the examination sheet the patient's uh, demographic profile uh, all the risk factors for rop the uh, silent entry segment uh, findings has to be documented again i think i will not talk about icrop3 but uh, we should follow the most recent and icrop3 guidelines uh, for documenting the zone and the stages of the rop so i think again uh, icrop3 will be calling this as uh, uh, incompletely vascularized retina so we should be if there is no rop there is incompletely vascularized retina then we should mention that it is incompletely vascularized zone 2 zone 3 retina so just writing plain no rop doesn't mean anything and doesn't carry any message so if you are encountering ap rop it is very important at least in indian scenario uh, the zone of ap rop again i will be calling it as ap rop uh, because mentioning the zone is very important in ap rop because the prognosis and the treatment management is entirely different again it's a good idea to write additional findings which are relevant to that particular case for example uh, presence of uh, ridge hemorrhages then popcorn lesion these are uh, important thing and whenever in uh, uh, doubt never hesitate to take a second opinion if you have a vitreo retina colleague with you it is a good idea to take a second opinion and Uh, mentioning the pediatric status or systemic condition about uh, the status of hemoglobin any recent history of blood transfusion history of sepsis that has to be documented as far as possible because all these are part of good documentation and will prove uh, to save you in cases of any litigation and uh, again this is one part which i uh, this is one of my software or how we do it Uh, the date of follow up has to be in the form of date and date doesn't mean uh, just numerical values it is good idea to write something like 9 february 2019 because we don't have any confusion between uh, day month and and at least never write it in the form of 10 days one week three weeks it doesn't carry any meaning in rop screening please avoid that so again uh, if you have a good handwriting it is good thing to uh, have but if you don't Uh, then it is good to have a printed summary and uh, that saves most of our time and uh, having a good summary or a good legible handwriting is saving you something which is not uh, uh, visible or not cannot be read by the uh, court then that will prove against you and uh, whenever possible we should uh, draw diagrams if uh, things are difficult to describe and uh, 
whenever possible if you have access to photographic documentation even with uh, there are now most of us can afford the fundus cameras then there are newer technologies where you can use smartphone so always try and possibly do a uh, photographic documentation that is very important and now it is part of the standard of care in uh, the documentation and uh, use inappropriate terms which will be proving against you in the court of law should not use anything like grade no rop posterior pole is normal try and avoid all these things and whenever we are trying to discharge any baby for from a rop screening then it is good idea that they will be requiring follow up for refraction or strabismus that has to be explained to the parents and has to be documented on the file also so again a need for regular follow up has to be explained and treatment has to be uh, the summary if you are providing it has to be legibly signed and documented whenever possible explaining the findings of examination to the parents is extremely important same thing has to be communicated to the pediatrician because he will play an important role in converting from someone to a vascular retina to rop and from rop to a treatable rop correction of these factors will make a impact on the patient's outcome and treatment is has to be done after systemic fixing and uh, laser is the standard of care for rop it has to be done in presence of ap rop and uh, the indication for rop has to be there on your file and uh, you should not be treating in pre in absence of plus disease or the plus disease has to be there on your papers for it and whenever treatment is indicated in most of the cases has to be done within 72 hours or in cases of ap rop within 24 hours and uh, while we are administering the treatment we should take care all the things that uh, there is no hypoglycemia there is no uh, hypothermia all the precautions has to be taken if you are doing treatment and if you are not experienced enough then it is better to refer that case rather than doing something which is not appropriate so and follow up again im explaining about the refractive error need for follow up is extremely important anti wage up as ma'am had said uh, what i will say is uh, we should avoid the indiscriminate use and take a good written informed consent again this was one of our publication from the indian i uh, rop society group where we uh, usually tend to recommend that babies with ap rop in the zone 1 they are the ideal candidate for ap rop and success rate in even in the best of the cases is around 90 to 95% of the cases it is very important to explain to the parents that's around 10 to 5% of the cases and those usually with ap rop may still need uh, surgical treatment that has to be explained and unusual recurrences can be seen with anti vijap that has to be explained to the uh, patient so to summarize i think uh, we should follow the preferred practice pattern and that is there in the standard of care counsel the parents appropriately that is the most crucial part and documentation is important and we should be keeping ourselves updated with the most recent uh, management strategies and classification and last thing guys i think uh, have a very good uh, professional indemnity at least more than 2 crores as of now and uh, that can save you if something goes wrong thank you thank you anil so important for everyone those who are uh, involved in this area this kind of a documentation which he has explained so well uh, i think we should all follow that uh, i think we have a keynote address by dr tarik uh, dr tarik uh, you know he's from bangladesh uh, he is in fact uh, trained in india with dr subhadra jalali uh, we have known dr tarik for a long time i think he's one of the first few people uh, those who started uh, doing uh, uh rop work in bangladesh uh, so we welcome dr tarik and for his keynote address actually um, at first i want to express my thanks to the scientific committee of all india ophthalmic society for allowing me to come here and uh, i am very much grateful and very much obliged very much privileged to talk in front of you sir but uh, the i'm sorry that my topic is a bit repetition with dr subina narang but i hope that uh, <coughs> my topic which will not bore you because it needs lot of discussion sir aprp3 it needs lot of discussion so i hope it will not bore you uh, i want to uh, tell my experience of icrp3 in bangladesh
as as you told sir i am a veteran of law of lv prasad institute from 2007 to 2008 i was there and um, i started rov practice in bangladesh from 2009 and now a lot of people are doing there so at first again uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to present in front of you this is you see at first there was classification of retrolental fibroplasia in 1953 then 1984 international classification, then 1987 it was expanded, and 2005 it included APROP, and uh, at, at last in 2021, I will not go in detail because Dr. Subin and Narang told about these things. This is already discussed, but why third edition is needed? At first it was the subjective interpretation of certain in uh, components of ICROP was there, and innovations in ophthalmic imaging and introduction of anti vasive therapy. This is very important. And there are the challenges in recognizes the uh, regression and reactivation. For those things, there was needed of the ICRP3. This was published in 2021, and this was, uh, you see, at least two persons from India, Paraksha and Anand Vineka, who was very much close to us. And uh, I'm very much happy that uh, they included these two Indians there. And uh, this study design was an uh, evidence-based literature that is study duration was from March 2019 to, to uh, March 2021. And 17 countries, 34 ophthalmologists out of the uh, 20 was retina specialist, 14 were uh, that is pediatric ophthalmologist. Uh, the main outcome measure was the consensus statement so the terminology is already Dr. Subina Narang told that at first there are six, uh, I find that six different difference between the, uh, that is uh, to 2005 and this 2021. Number one is this posterior, uh, uh, zone two posterior, which already Dr. Subina Narang told us. This is number two is uh, notch, very nicely uh, shown uh, here. And number three, this is uh, the, 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 they defined pre-threshold and threshold in their literature. Number three is that the pre-plus and plus, that it should be the changes to be assessed in the zone one rather than the narrow field fundus photo, which was in 2005 classification. That is the number three difference. And uh, the stages, as uh, already we, we know, it, this is like this, but uh, they decided to not to tell the immature retina. They told us to tell that it, it should be told that incomplete vascularization. The stages are similar. The demarcation line, then the stage uh, two is the rease. The stage three is extra retinal neovascular proliferation. And number four, that aggressive ROP, they have told that no, this is not aggressive posterior ROP only. This was based on our literature only, and uh, they have told now that this is aggressive ROP, not only aggressive posterior ROP. This is the picture of LB Prasad I Institute I took from them. And stage four and four B, it was previously like this, but stage five, you see, it was that uh, open, that is the classification is similar, but stage five they have classified into three, that stage five A, five B, and five C. So five A is optic disc is visible, five B is optic disc not visible, and five C is five B plus anterior segment abnormality like close funnel artery that is shallowing of anterior chamber, arido corneal lenticular adhesion, and corneal opacification. Number six change is the, uh, that is regression and reactivation. That's already Dr. Subina Narang very nicely told that uh, regression might be complete, it might be incomplete, it can be spontaneous or it can be after uh, treatment. This is regression of the ROP. And after regression, we have to tell persistent avascular retina. This is another new term they have used, persistent avascular retina, according to the location and extent of persistent avascular retina we have to mention. Then next number six is reactivation. Another thing, it can reactivate anywhere after the, actually after the anti vasive that can reactivate. So what are the signs of reactivation? New lesion from the self-limiting demarcation line to reactivate at stage three with plus disease. Where can reactivation occur? At site of original rease or leading edge of the new lesion. And it can occur elsewhere, anywhere. anywhere. Documentation is very much needed, as, as I already told, but we have to tell it that reactivated. Demarcation line during reactivation is termed as reactivated stage one. 
So this is stage three reactivation. Now, now some long-term sequelae that retinal detachment, it can be tractional, it can be regmatogenous, it can be exudative even. Retinoscisis, persistent avascular retina is more prone to retinal thinning, hole and lattice-like changes. The macular abnormality like a smaller foveal avascular zone, this type of, uh, that is long-term sequelae they have mentioned and numbers uh, very much important is glaucoma, secondary angle closer glaucoma later in life. After this, uh, that is summary, we can tell that zone two posterior is more worrisome disease. The notch is incl included here. The stage five is subcategories and pre plus and plus disease should be assessed by vessels within the zone one. Aggressive ROP it replaces the aggressive posterior ROP and regression, reactivation and long-term sequelae. So after this publication, there are two correspondence that is letter to editor. One is from LVPI that uh, Dr. Sub uh, Subhadra Jalali and uh, her team, they told that quality issues of resource, resource limitations were there and they told that aggressive ROP is increasingly recognized in region of the world with limited resources. They have a, uh, that is limitation that why we have to, we have to tell that limit, limited resources uh, whether they are mentioning our that is countries that these countries, but in reply they told that the phrase limited resources is it encompasses the equipment, neonatal and ophthalmic personnel as well as the expertise, not only this third world country. Another uh, correspondence was from uh, Dr. Rajbordan Ajad and, uh, and his team that uh, they told that that what Dr. Uh, Dogra has already told that hybrid ROP they wanted to mention it. But in reply, they told that the committee wished to avoid the additional subdivision where possible. These two correspondents I could find. So what is my experience in Bangladesh? Actually, we are not aware of this classification. Uh, uh, we, we, we read it, but we couldn't follow in our day-to-day -day practice. We didn't change our the documentation forms and other things. So our, uh, Dr. Subhadra was there in, from, that is in the last week only, 22, 26 May, and she narrated very nicely. Uh, there, uh, there you see a lot of people are very much interested now in Bangladesh to do ROP there, and uh, uh, we have a very good team there. And uh, Dr. Subhadra narrated very nicely, and she, she only showed that yes, there is persistent avascular retina. You can see here, and there are notches here. And uh, we, we, with our red cam, they, she mentioned us. So our recommendation is that I told earlier that it needs a lot of discussions. The new classification, it is uh, not that is very familiar to us. And I hope that we have to formulate the new data collection sheets, and we have to incorporate into the curriculum of our residents in future who are coming to uh, classify this disease. So thank you very much for your patience hearing, sir. Thank you very much uh, for allowing me to talk in front of you. Thank you thank very you. much, Dr. Tariq. I think you have given such a clear understanding of the newer classification and what are the components. Uh, thank you for being with us and uh, uh, making everybody wiser how we should be following these cases and documenting in future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. I think now we can have uh, any questions for another. Uh, we have more, I mean, five to ten minutes we have. We'll be happy to answer any questions from the hall. So my question to you uh, would be, how can we add objectivity to plus disease, sir? It still, I would say, is a big gray zone. So. I, I think that has been the biggest problem uh, always and a uh, lot of things were uh, done earlier but mostly I think uh, they came back to the standard photograph and you compare with that so that is what uh, happens all the time. I, I think if we uh, have something which can really sort of uh, say that this much of uh, dilatation tortuosity yeah. would go to a process but it will still probably at this time remain uh, uh, what you said. So I think is AI could have an answer to this. Maybe they are uh, trying. I think they tried even uh, certain other things. Uh, in fact, a lot of work is done uh, by the Michael Chang group on this front. He is major uh, contribution who is now NEI director himself. Uh, so, But still, we don't have the uh, real answer for this. Yeah. Yeah, she is. Yeah. I think my view on this will be because last year I, I was working with uh, that AI in ROP. So 
आई थिंक एज लॉन्ग एज आर ओ पी स्क्रीन इज बींग डन बाय ऑप्थर्मोलॉजिस्ट और सम ह्यूमन बींग वी आर गोइंग टू हैव दैट वेरिएशन एंड सब्जेक्टिविटी द डे इट इज एंटायरली रिप्रेस्ड बाय आई दर द टेक्नोलॉजी और ए आई ए आई विल बी बैक्ड बर्थ विथ दैट ह्यूज नंबर ऑफ डाटा एंड द मशीन्स एंड ए आई टेंट टू बी वेरी एक्यूरेट कंपेयर टू द ह्यूमन सब्जेक्टिविटी सो दैट इज द आंसर दैट वी विल बी आई थिंक नेक्स्ट फाइव टू टेन ईयर्स दैट विल बी इन प्रैक्टिस Uh, i think that's a very good uh, this thing maybe in future we'll have the machine itself telling that this is free plus or plus <laughs> that is what would happen <laughs> uh, sir i would uh, dr anil i would just like to add uh, for your talk which you gave about medical legal aspects i take a r- uh, written consent which the parents write themselves when we are doing the procedure which may be laser or which may be injection so that way you can make them understand all the nuances short term and long term about a uh, need to follow up for next 10 years need for further more procedures if it doesn't work i think that is one very good aspect once they write it in their own hand rightly said sir if it can be written by the parents it is the most appropriate thing that can be done and if not by parents at least by the treating of thermologist if he can write in his own words and in the uh, word that the parents understand that is the most ideal condition in terms of medical legal thing i would also say uh, sir there have to be lots of handouts about education material to the parents and they should say yes we have read all this education material and then write all this consent other thing again if we are talking about medical legal then that audio visual consent is one thing that is coming up <laughs> with time again that is if that can be done that is the right thing for us so we can shift on any questions yes sir question is uh, do you experience any secondary glaucoma as a complications of rop yeah i think we have uh, experienced glaucoma in almost um, all severe forms of rop and whenever i operate i definitely in fact now i started keeping the children prophylactically on small dose of uh, anti glaucoma medication iobet because and if you have removed the lens then this uh, incidence increases younger the babies you operate the incidence increases if you do aggressive rop surgery the incidence is almost 100% almost all babies will have and if you wait that okay when the patient comes at one month follow up then you will see with the pressure is high and then you start by one month itself they come with increased corneal diameter so it is as bad as that and in fact recently there is a publication which has come from the tracy's group they have followed up these babies who are premature with or without history of treatment and they have said that 19 years or 20 years of age in adulthood they ha- all have increased ocular hypertension at least so this has to be explained to uh, the parents that they have to keep a tab on it even if they have not undergone treatment so this is a very valid question thank you for bringing it up i think the first thing i tell the parents is well we are friends for life it doesn't end here i'll treat you but you continue seeing me because if i treat and the patient lands up in in um, amblyopia it's as good as not doing anything so all of these babies they have high refractive error they have lots of other problems so once an rop baby comes to you it's friendship for life long last one yeah yes. uh, i have a small comment to make ma'am regarding the medical legal aspect that uh, uh, one huge step of preventing a medical legal uh, uh um, case scenario is that all of us need to make our opds baby friendly uh, we do see a lot of follow ups in our opds and we are not in an nicu all the time and most eye surgeons will not have a suction or an oxygen supply oxi- uh, oxygen in their opds and uh, these babies are really prone to apnea even in a regular screening they can go in apnea so especially if the technician is doing it and uh, you're not very careful so uh, it is a good idea to have some basic uh, Uh, equipment in your opd if you're doing rop screening and we need to have suction machines and um, oxygen available and uh, we can prevent a lot of uh, unforeseen complications in terms of apnea or uh, uh, if you have those set those things in your opd i think that is uh, another important thing 
uh, regular IOPD is not equipped to do um, ROP screening unless we have those backup equipments with us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A very nice comment. But I would also like to say that here I would li uh, like to emphasize in case it's setting up of an ROP clinic. So first few examinations have to be in the presence of pediatrician because we tend to indent instead of rotation and patients do land up in problem. So make sure that once it's a newer examination, it has to be in front of the neonatologist. So we just quickly conclude with one uh, experience that I had. So this was during COVID. Twins were brought to me for uh, screening. And uh, just the optometrist who had noted down the history, and she came to me that one of the babies is not crying well. So can you just see? So it was good of her that she noticed. I saw the baby. The baby was really not crying, almost getting blue. We have a physician who's always there so and an anesthetist team. So we sent, the child was in apnea, child was COVID positive and immediately had to be hospitalized and intubated. So this cannot be underemphasized. Thank you. Okay, thank you everybody. And uh, thank you, my coaches, Dr. Anil, Dr. Praveen, Sar, <laughs> Dr. Diksha, uh, Dr. Kapoor. Right, thank you very much. And we'll have one photograph. <laughs>